Marty, a financial advisor at a prestigious firm, was in the middle of advising an indecisive couple on opening an account, when he received a shocking email. Without showing any emotion, he discovered an image resembling his wife with another man. At that moment, Bruce, Marty's colleague and best friend, entered, fabricating a story about today being the last day to sign up due to upcoming client restrictions, instantly making up the couple's mind to hop on the train while they still can. Marty doesn't have the best people skills. The two of them are looking at a new office space for their firm, and Bruce with his side piece loves the place, but Marty finds faults in the smallest details. Taking Marty aside, Bruce notes that he saw his computer screen, and Marty rubbing one off at the office won't do well for his 22 years of marriage. Maybe his marriage isn't going so well, so Bruce gives him a brochure to Lake of the Ozark. Great place, great people, fantastic view. He has to put it on his vision board. The office space is still for debate though. Later, at the family dinner with his wife Wendy and two kids, Charlotte and Jonah, the big sister is picking on her little brother and the conversation gets heated. When Wendy finally resets the conversation, telling everyone about her exciting day, where her culmination was going grocery shopping. Marty weirdly points out she did groceries this Monday as well. When Charlotte asks for $10 for a fundraiser, Marty acts a bit dickish, he really likes to save up money. With just two of them left, Marty thanks Wendy for dinner, but there is a noticeable tension between the couple. Before going to bed, Marty is still re-watching the video, with Wendy being close by. He can clearly see it's his wife in the video, but as she is about to go to bed, he displays no emotion, being awfully quiet. He just has something on his mind. Marty tucks in his kids and goes for a drive, contemplating going tit for tat with his wife. But the hooker quickly figures out he hasn't done this before, he's too clean and handsome. She knows it has something to do with his wife. Talking dirty to him before going down, when a woman knocks on his window, telling him to stop beating his meat at their workplace. It was all an imagination, he couldn't go through with it. A sudden call distracts him. Bruce is calling him from a desolate place, telling him to come over in the middle of the night. Marty is reluctant, but one mention of Dell, their boss, and he drives right over. A bunch of thugs let him in, and the whole squad is there. Dell walks in, grabs Marty and asks where his $5 million is. Marty is clueless. Dell works for a drug cartel and uses Marty's company to launder his money, but someone stole 5 million and he wants to know who. The two truckers, father and son, swear they would never steal, but the numbers don't lie. Dell goes into a whole story about having a cashier, who worked for them for 15 years, someone he would call aunt, because she was always at their store. And then one day, his father was closing up and saw Aunt Carlotta slip $5 out of the till into her pocket. His father couldn't believe it. Carlotta needed the money to buy medicine for her kid with asthma. She cried like a baby and swore she would never do it again, begging him not to fire her. Dell asks the trucker what should his father do with Carlotta. Put her on probation, he answers, typical American thinking. One mistake in 15 years, Bruce would give her another chance. But Marty figures out it's an intimidation audit, he knows Dell is fishing, he wants someone to admit to skimming. They've been laundering money for Mr. Navarro for 10 years, there is no Aunt Carlotta here. Dell had enough of yapping, shooting up the bathroom where the side chick is and making it clear, he isn't there to jerk around. Quickly words start flying around, the truckers say it was Bruce's idea, and sound starts to fade for Marty as he thinks this might be the end. Zip tying their hands on the ground, Marty emotionlessly just sits there as they place the girl's body in acid. The father begs him for forgiveness, but Dell's mind is set, he shoots both the truckers with only Bruce and Marty left. Dell wants to know, how did Bruce do it, how did he skim $5 million? They rigged the gas gauges, they read full, when they were 5 gallons light. They stole 8 million over 3 years. His dying words are, Marty had nothing to do with this. As it's Marty's turn, he just wants to say goodbye to his kids, picking his pocket for a phone and a brochure slips out. Dell doesn't let Marty tell his kids anything, his kids know he loves them. As Dell asks if he's ready to die, Marty stalls, he notices the brochure Bruce gave him earlier, starting to think up of a story how Ozark has more shoreline than California and every summer the population explodes. Tons of tourists with loads of cash. The FBI, CIA, DEA all are circling around Chicago, but they're in Ozarks, it's away from every single law enforcement agency in the US and it's cash rich. If they laundered 10% of the cartel's money before, he asks for more, if gives him a chance in Ozarks, he will launder more than anyone there. In three years, he will wash twice more money than they are doing right now. He promises to wash 500 million in five years. Dell sits him down, about to end him, as Marty's life flashes before his eyes. But suddenly, Dell asks Marty, 500 million in five years? Yeah, no question. Marty has 48 hours to get Dell his money and he wants Marty to be ready to set up shop within a week. This brochure saves Marty's life. At home, Wendy tries to reason with Marty, she wants to involve the police. 
but their best chance would be witness protection, if they even could get that far. There is no real option here, they have to act on the promise. In the next two days he has to come up with 8 million that Bruce stole. Marty tells Wendy the whole plan, sell the house, withdraw everything they have and tell the kids they are moving. In the morning Charlotte refuses to leave Chicago, they're telling the kids that they are moving because of job opportunity, disclosing the real reason, at least Jana is fine with whatever. Marty liquidates all of his assets, cash, which amounts to $7,945,400. But there's a problem, the bank doesn't keep that much cash on hand, but he spits some laws at the bank and wants the money by the end of today. Wendy tells her lover that they are in deep shit and she will be leaving with her family to Ozarks, where the primary color is camouflage. Marty's detective figured out who Wendy's secret lover is, he sees Wendy at least twice a week, sometimes more, some kind of a big shot lawyer. The lover tells Wendy to divorce Marty and get as much money from him while she still can. Just as Marty wonders how hard it would be to make someone disappear, by this he means his family, he gets a text from the bank, Wendy just emptied their checkings and savings. Seeing how bleak the situation is, the detective gives Marty the lover's apartment location, he is sure Wendy is there. While Marty is trying to save the whole family, Wendy backstabs him at the worst moment, ignoring his calls. Out of anger, he talks to himself in the car, for 22 years he hasn't cheated, not once, even when he had the chance. Meanwhile Wendy returns to her lover, but Dell is already there. Marty is on his way to the guy, still muttering how he will lawyer up and show her ugly, just when the lover slams the ground. Marty looks closely, yep, that's him, his K to leave. Dell calls Marty from Wendy's phone, finding a check for $29,000. Wendy knows about his business. Dell offers Marty to take care of his Wendy problem, right here and right now, or will he live with her cheating on him, that will eat at him for the rest of his life, his call. The silence is crushing for Wendy. Dell brings up his Aunt Carlotta again, Marty never answered the question, what should his father do, a loyal woman, a mother? Marty says fire her, it's not the first time she stole from him, it's the first time he caught her. Marty arrives at home, with Wendy arriving soon after, he chose not to kill the mother of his children, despite the cheating. Arriving at the bank with bags, the feds start a checkup, because why would anyone, without prior notice, withdraw so much money in cash? But he explains that he has a business opportunity that requires cash, but I'm sure there are no business opportunities that require that much cash, not legal ones. But even if he wanted to buy a hot tub, fill it with cash and play Scrooge McDuck, that is his business and he wants his money, easily walking out with bags filled with bills. Handing the money over to Dell, he is $7,000 short, but he still has a minivan to sell, so Dell buys it off of him, renting out for a $1,000 a month. Now Dell wants Marty to take his $8 million to Ozark and clean it. He explains it's already clean, but Dell wants to see if Marty can actually do it, he doesn't care if he loses money and taxes on it. He is torn between the intrigue of it, and this whole Ozark thing being straw grasping BS. But he is willing to see it through, because Marty is special. But if he feels something is wrong, he will kill him and his whole family. Also Marty was right about Dell fishing the other day, he didn't know Bruce stole a damn thing. As the rest of the family pack the bags, Wendy can't maintain calm demeanor, Charlotte can tell something is going on. The FBI are already all over the new flat, looking for Bruce, but there is no sign of him. Agent Petty had already bugged the whole place, they've been on the company for a while. Turns out Bruce was also a rat for the FBI. Finally on their way to Ozark, Marty stops midway to take a leak, but realistically, he finally shows some emotions as the burden of it all starts to really set in. Noticing the lake, the whole family joins him in. This is their new home, this is their new life. The first night the family stays at Lazy O Motel, but time is a pressing matter. Marty has to decide how to wash money and Wendy will look for a house to buy. Meanwhile the two kids are to stand guard and not let anyone into their room. The couple still don't have a story explaining why they are in such a rush to change their conditions. The whole ordeal is getting to Wendy, she doesn't understand why her lover had to die, and that's when Marty finally lets his emotions loose about her cheating on him. The only thing that lets him sleep at night, is the satisfying sound of her lover smacking the pavement. Honestly that was a bit too harsh, even for him. Working with a $20,000 budget for a house, Wendy has a job panned out for her. In the office, Sam is the only one there, doing some peanut butter and a dog thing, you know, but she couldn't care less. Meanwhile Marty gains access to public records of all the businesses in the area, under the pretense of being an angel investor, turning around businesses that aren't making any money. One of the first businesses he considers is self-storage. Trying to get on the owner's good side, he rents out a place himself, but you can't teach an old dog new tricks, the man isn't interested in any business Marty is proposing. His search continues through day and night, but most of the company owners are wary of outsiders and refuse to deal with Marty, sensing that his deal of controlling their finance books for a minuscule profit is too good. 
Same story as with Wendy, with only $20,000 to work with, every place is in some way too disgusting to live in. Even a glance from outside is enough to make her turn the car around. Over the next few days both of their searches prove futile and the clock is ticking. Meanwhile, Wyatt is hitting on Charlotte. She tries to play it cool, but his invite to wakeboarding sounds really appealing, especially since they were stuck doing nothing at the motel for the past few days. Jonah tells her it's a bad idea, but like every teenage girl, she doesn't care. Marty finally has some chance at a local titty bar, but the owner knows he's here to wash money and asks for 25%, he doesn't play games. Still a bust. Sam brings Wendy to a wonderful property, with a wide shoreline. Best part, she can afford it, there is a catch though. Charlotte gets on a boat with Wyatt and his cousin. All the time Wyatt is adamant that he's from out of town and presents the whole place and the boat as his father's, cleverly deceiving the girl into having a high status in society. The little Jonah also had enough of sitting around. He packs what he thinks are the most valuable possessions into his bag, and goes to the arcade to finally satisfy his boredom. The catch with the house is that Buddy is selling the house under the condition that he can live there until he dies, the reason for the low price. He has a bad heart and Doc told him he has 18 months tops. Buddy is a very direct person, sometimes he says things that are hard to stomach, but the deal isn't that bad. Finally teens have a moment to explore their surroundings and have fun, but the fun doesn't last, boat patrol notices them and begins pursuit. Charlotte finally catches on that everything Wyatt said is a lie, as he throws her off the boat to save his own skin. The whole ordeal leads Charlotte's parents to the local PD, the owner is suing for damages, and the sheriff assures the birds that Wyatt can't pay, leaving the bill in Marty's hands. This sends him off the rails, demanding that the white trash that brought his daughter into it be arrested. But the sheriff thinks it's a waste of time and believes the tourists can handle the bill. That's when Wendy reveals they've put a deposit on a home in the area, and are about to become residents and they will be paying taxes, a lot, insinuating that the sheriff be on good terms with them if he wants to be re-elected. Well, a call won't do any harm, bring in the Langmores. The sheriff notes they're lucky they didn't meet Ruth, she's smart and mean, a criminal and staff at the Lazy O Motel. Marty charges back into the motel, checking the stash and seeing the room tidied up. Jonah says it was him, but when Marty notices the knife that Jonah's new friend Tuck gave him on the beach, he quickly surmises that the place was unguarded. Marty pulls the bags with money and the suitcase is light. After getting the kids out, Marty opens it, it's empty. He calls the sheriff but can't disclose that he just lost a few millions in cash. Charlotte apologizes to him, in a sniffling voice she mentions that she has an idea where Ruth might be. This gives Marty an idea and he stocks up on fishing supplies, including two huge mobile fridges. He rents out a boat, and buys some catfish off of a local. Using a map given to him by Charlotte, he arrives at the place where Wyatt left the boat and goes to an abandoned bathroom, where he hears the whole Langmore family arguing about how they have right to Marty's cash, since this amount is most likely ill-gotten. Marty storms in, assuring them that they would never be able to use this money, and they can't stick it behind a urinal or put it in a bank, IRS would be all over it. That's just a lifetime supply of gas and groceries. Technically, the cash isn't even Marty's, he's only responsible for it, revealing that he works for Navarro. 3 Googles him, revealing to everyone he's a Mexican cartel. So if Langmores aren't killers they have to return the money, otherwise when Dell comes, he will come looking for the money and skin them all alive. Ruth tries to argue that Marty is bluffing, but if the Langmores don't want to watch over their shoulders for the rest of their life, their best option is to walk away. Wyatt and Three take this opportunity, but Russ still takes $20,000 for his troubles and also walks away. Ruth gets the feeling that Marty would be better off dead, before walking away. Marty loaded the fridges with money, covering it with ice and catfish, before riding back across the lake, putting all the money in his newly acquired storage space, in a tube, for safekeeping. Meanwhile the FBI found the truck carrying the acidic barrels where Bruce was stuffed in on the road. Agent Petty will be transferring to Missouri, to spy on Marty. He is sure he had something to do with Bruce's death and the 8 million cash he withdrew is suspicious. Marty is definitively doing something illegal there, and it's a matter of time before Petty will catch him. In the morning, Marty gives his kids a kiss and Jonah apologizes for leaving the motel unguarded, revealing that his new-made friend Tuck works at the Blue Cat Lodge, where no one stays, or eats at the restaurant or drinks at the bar. That's Marty's kind of place. Marty wakes Wendy up and outside he tells her to take the kids and flee. When Marty will die, his life insurance will pay out $1 million and they could live off of that. The point is, there is no way he could wash $8 million in three months here. He was just grasping at straws. He wants Wendy to call the sheriff in three hours and tell him that he hasn't come back from hiking, that is where they will find his body. Wendy tries to stop him, reasoning that there is still a way out, but Marty is out of ideas. On his way to remove himself, Marty calls his detective, asking about the chance of insurance not paying up if something happens to a person. Unfaithful spouse or unusual behavior is ammunition the insurance could use to not pay out Marty's life insurance. 
Basically Wendy and the kids could end up with nothing. Remembering what Jonah said and seeing the sign to the Blue Cat Lodge, he decides to give it a try. Just as Wendy is calling the sheriff and about to send the location for the money to Dell, notifying about Marty's death, he comes back, saying that he wasn't thinking straight. Rachel is the owner of the deserted rundown Blue Cat Lodge. This time though, Marty changes his strategy, he isn't trying to change the business, he's willing to invest in Rachel, believing she can turn this place around. But Rachel isn't interested in getting even more debt from Marty, doubting that she could recoup his investment. Just as he is about to let this idea go, a drink can't hurt. Tuck works at the bar here, and some billies call him the R word. Marty pounces on it, defending Tuck and goes even harder once he sees Rachel come in. Marty won't tolerate this kind of behavior. Marty wants the big man to apologize to Tuck for disrespecting him, calling him a miserable redneck sucker. That warranted a punch to the face, but somehow Rachel liked Marty defending the place. Meanwhile the kids arrive at their new place, already getting to know Buddy. Charlotte once again asks, what are they doing there and Wendy just comes out and says it, they are laundering money for the Mexican drug cartel. I shit you not. Thank you for watching. Subscribe for more videos like this.